Well, good evening to you all. Welcome into God's house. Very uh, warm welcome to Daniel and Rachel. We're very glad that you're here amongst us, and uh, thank you for coming uh, to bring God's word to us. Uh, we're going to, uh, to start off by singing number 59 in the Mission Praise. Number 59, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And let's just take a moment just to think about how wonderful it is to be able to say, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. That the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us uh, is our Saviour and our Lord and our elder brother and our friend. So uh, let's stand to sing number 59 from the Mission Praise, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Praising my Saviour all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Saviour all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Saviour all the day long. Mission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Saviour all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Saviour all the day long. Thank you. But as you know, on a Sunday evening, I've been reading through uh, Psalm 119, and um, we're going to pick it up at uh, verse 137. Psalm 119, verse 137. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Your testimonies, which you have commanded, are righteous and very faithful. My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your words. Your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. I cry out with my whole heart, Hear me, O, God, o Lord, I will keep your statutes. 
I cry out to you, save me and I will keep your testimonies. I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. My eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. O Lord, revive me according to your justice. They draw near who follow after wickedness. They are far from your law. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them forever. Well, so reads God's holy word. Well, let's stand to sing our second hymn, and it's from number 50, from the Mission Praise, number 50. Be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Let's stand to sing when the music starts, number 50. Feel for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come now before Him now, with reverence and sung in our hearts and minds let's come before God in prayer let's all pray and Heavenly Father we thank you that although we meet in an ordinary building it's not a particularly special building in many ways and yet there is the sense that this is your building because it has been set apart for your worship and for the preaching and teaching of your word. And so there is a very real sense that as we come into this place, that we are coming into the presence of God in a special way. And we ask that, Lord, you would help us to come before you this evening with reverence and with fear. Not a, a craving fear as uh, a slave would uh, be afraid before its master, but a godly <coughs> fear, a, a reverential fear a respect, a sense of awe and worship as we come before the one who is the most high God, the one of whom we read spoke and this world that we live in came into being day by day until the sixth day was finished 
and all was complete. This is the God that we worship. This is not a myth made up from man. This is not a cunningly devised fable that we blindingly believe. But you are a God who gives evidence of your existence. And when we look with the psalmist at the moon and the stars and the sun, when we see the vastness of your creation, we, we are moved to ask, what is man that you are mindful of him, son of man, that you care for him? And yet as we come into your presence this evening, Lord, we are reminded that you do care for us. We know that you loved us, in fact, before you made the world. And that before you made the world, you always knew that there would be that time that you would send your son into the world to be the saviour of sinners. And we are sinners. There's nothing special about us. We may look posh on the outside, but Lord, on the inside, we are full of sin. There is no, no one that does good. There's none that's righteous, not even one. Not even the most respectable looking amongst us. Not even that the richest, cleverest, wisest person is, is anything other than a sinner. Mm. And so, Lord, we are humbled by that. It, it breaks our pride to be reminded that we are sinners, to be reminded that we are just not good enough for you, that we all fall short, we all miss the mark, we all transgress the lines, we all go astray and all go our own way. And so this evening we don't come in this house to boast about our goodness. We come to boast about your goodness yes, and Lord. your kindness and your mercy. Yes, and we bow with our faces to the ground, as it were, Lord, to thank you that you would ever send your son to die for people like us. But we thank you that that's what we've been singing about. We can sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, because you have opened our eyes to see our need of a saviour. There came a day when we came to you in repentance and faith, believing in you, trusting in your word. And we thank you that, uh, as we were looking on, on Thursday night from your word, because you are alive, Lord Jesus, because you didn't stay dead in the grave, that because you live, we will live also. And so we thank you, Lord God, that you have made this world. We thank you that you have shown yourself to be the almighty God. We thank you that you have sent your son to be the saviour of sinners. We thank you that your Holy Spirit has come to us, regenerating us, that we are born again, born from above, born of water and the spirit, and that we have entered into a relationship with you. And it's all of you. The glory and the thanks and the praise all belong to you. And so we've come to say thank you. We have come to worship. We have come to bow down and to get rid of pride, and to ask you once again, Lord, that you would be our God and our Lord. We pray that you would forgive us for our sins of this week. Lord, as we look again at the things that we have done and left undone, the things that we have thought, the things that we have said, the attitudes of selfishness and self-centeredness that we still have, Lord, we are ashamed. And once again we come to you and we ask you that the blood of the Lord Jesus would cleanse us of all our sins. That we may be right with you, that we may walk right with you, that we may live for you this week in a way which honours you and glorifies you. So Lord we thank you for the privilege that we have of coming into this house of prayer and worshipping you. We pray that Lord that you would come amongst us and that you would bless us. You've promised to bless your people wherever they're gathered. you promised to bless your church, even if only two or three are gathered. And the Lord Jesus made that promise. And so we pray that you would help us to hear your voice this evening. As we speak to you, as we offer our worship to you, may you speak to us through your word. That as your word is read and taught tonight, that you would bless us from it. Speak to us from it. Perhaps it's a word of encouragement, a word of correction, a word of training. Lord, whatever it may be, we pray that you would speak to us through your word. We pray that you would bless Daniel as he comes to bring your word to us. We pray that you would bless him in his own soul and that he would be a channel of blessing to each and every one of us this evening. We pray for our 
company, Lord, uh, who are not here this evening. Uh, we pray for those who could be here and aren't uh, because they've, they've grown cold, they've grown lazy, whatever the reason, we pray that you would speak to them and stir them up. We pray for those who would love to be here but cannot be because they're not well or because they are kept by a duty. Lord, where they are, we pray, you would bless them, that you would touch them, particularly for those who are not well, we pray that you would heal them. We again bring John's wife, uh, Jill, before you this evening and pray that this treatment that she's had would be successful, but now that the painful, painful side effects that she's endured would begin to subside very quickly. Lord, we pray for her, that you would touch her body and that she would be well. We pray for the people around this church, Lord. We ask that once again that you would bless them with salvation. Mm. You've told us to go out and make disciples, but Lord, we cannot save a single soul. That work belongs to you and you alone. Yes. And so we pray that you would do your work. Mm. Heavenly Father, it seems almost irreverent to ask you to do your work, but we, we, with all due reverence, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit into this area, that people would come to know you as Saviour and Lord, that he would be at work doing that work that only he can. We pray for our city of Colchester. We thank you for other churches that will be proclaiming your gospel tonight. We pray that for each one, <coughs> you would bless them, you would be with them, you would empower those who preach, that men and women and boys and girls tonight, by your grace, would be saved. And so we pray for the area around here. Help us to know what we can do as part of that mission to take the gospel out, to make disciples of all nations. Mm. And we pray that, Lord, you would do what only you can do mm. and save lost souls. So hear us then, Lord, we pray. We come to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, can I invite you to turn to our reading for this evening and we're going to continue in our studies of Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Psalm 23. the Lord, the shepherd of his people. It's a psalm of David. And although for many of us, we could quote this psalm off by heart, it's a very well-known psalm, yet as we read through the psalm, just have a look at the pictures that are being given for, uh, to us to, to look at. Just, just be aware uh, of what uh, David is using to make his points. Where we read, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And so is God's word. Well, we're going to sing a song based on that psalm, number 660 from Mission Praise, 660. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie. And after that, Daniel will come and bring God's word to us. So let's stand when the music starts and sing number 660. Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. He leadeth me the quiet waters by. My soul. He Oh, my 
righteousness in for his own name's sake. Very good uh, evening to you all. It's, as usual, a pleasure to be here with you uh, in person and to be able to uh, gather around God's Word uh, with one another. Even as the nights are drawing in and the cold is setting in, we can still gather in the warmth of God's house tonight. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's always a pleasure for me and Rachel uh, to be with you. Um, and last time I was here, it was was it September sometime, I think, uh, we started looking through this amazing psalm of Psalm 23. Uh, we only covered the first verse last time. Um, today we'll go one better. We'll look at verses 2 and 3. Um, but I think it's one of those psalms that's so full of meaning and so rich uh, in goodness and, and, and just shows the love of God so clearly. I think there's always more we can learn from it with each uh, even passing uh, reading of it. I think when we were here last on the, our journey back to Cambridge, we were, uh, there's a couple of Christian radio stations on that we can get in the car. And it just so happened that when we were going home uh, that Sunday evening, there was a, a sermon on Psalm 23. Um, and yeah, it, it was a great, a blessing for me even after giving a, a, a sermon on Psalm 23 to receive one as well. Um, I think that, that, that was a blessing for me. I was filled uh, by God's work driving back. Um, but on to tonight, uh, we'll be looking at two verses, verses 2 and 3 of Psalm 23. I'll read them now. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So that's what we'll be hoping to look at this evening. And I wonder if anyone here has heard of the term FOMO, F-O-M-O. -O. I think it's a fairly modern uh, acronym, if you like. Um, it stands for the fear of missing out. Um, I think it's especially common today in this social media heavy and influenced age where people can easily see what their friends and what the people they're following are up to, what they're doing, what trends they should be keeping up with. Mm -hmm. And there is that fear of missing out on what your friends are and what your colleagues are doing in this world. You don't want to miss out. And I for myself, I don't remember the exact time or the date that I became a Christian. I, I, I didn't have one of those light bulb moments. But I do remember before giving my life to Christ, whenever that was, I, I, I do remember 
thinking, well, if I do become a Christian, well, that's a, that's a big, um, it's a big thing. It's a big commitment, isn't it? Maybe I won't be able to do stuff that my friends are doing. Or what will my friends think? Will I lose out on stuff in this world if I become a Christian? And I know, and I'm sure many of you here know, uh, certain people who've either lost friends, uh, lost relationships, even been rejected by their family members, uh, as well as having issues at work and with jobs because of their own Christian faith. Maybe sometimes we can look at the world and what's happening in the world and sometimes think, is there more satisfaction there? Is there more satisfaction elsewhere outside of Christianity? And I think for me, whenever those thoughts do pop into my head, it's helpful to be reminded of Psalm 23 verse 1, which says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. As a child of God, we will lack no good thing in this life. We can find full and great sufficiency in Jesus and what he offers and what he gives us and what he has already done for us. And hopefully in verses 2 and 3 tonight, we'll see the, if you like, the very real benefits of being sheep in God's flock. Last time we established that we are the sheep in the flock and God in Christ is the shepherd, the good shepherd. And I, I, I think we can generally admit that sheep aren't the most uh, fancy or impressive or grand creatures uh, in the animal kingdom. They're not the fastest, they're not the smartest, etc. But God's sheep, we do have a shepherd. We have the good shepherd who both loves us and cares for us dearly. Amen. We'll see that the Good Shepherd grants us a very real rest. He grants us refreshment, restoration, redirection, and reassurance. But I think before we get onto those benefits, I think it's important to note that those benefits and, and what verses 2 and 3 and Psalm 23 as a whole they speak of those specifically in God's flock. It doesn't speak of those outside of God's flock, if you like. It doesn't speak of what we may call the goats in the world. It doesn't speak of the wolves in sheep's clothing or the sheep of other people's flocks. But it speaks of the true sheep of God. The true sheep of the Good Shepherd, Jehovah Ra. Amen. God's sheep are those who have been predestined and called. They've been saved and forgiven. They've been justified and will one day be glorified. We know that not everyone in this world is or will be within the flock of God. But Jesus does say in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way, is the only way to God, to the Father, to heaven. But anyone can go through him. Anyone is able to accept that offer, to come through the way, the truth, and to life, the life, to go through Jesus. We as Christians hopefully recognize that we're not any better or any righteous or any more righteous than anyone else in this world. Mm -hmm. But what makes us different is that one, we acknowledge how fallen we are, but we also stand in the grace of God. In repentance, we receive, we receive forgiveness. By faith in Christ, we receive salvation and everlasting life and joy in God. So on to our first, if you like, real benefit uh, that we can see the shepherd giving us in verse 2 of Psalm 23. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. 
I'm sure you've heard the saying, the grass is greener on the other side. Well, I can assure you that it is at its greenest and most lush where Jesus leads the flock. And I think we can note that this, this grass, it's not primarily for the sheep to eat, but for the sheep to rest in. God recognizes the importance of rest. After all, he rested on the seventh day of creation. God does give us as Christians an eternal spiritual rest. He also offers a very real and present sense of rest in every sense, physically to spiritually to emotionally and mentally that we can access through him. And Jesus himself in Matthew eleven, twenty eight to twenty nine says, Come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We all face situations in this life uh, that test us, whether that be literal tests at school, uh, testing circumstances in, in work and in relationships. And I think it's often easy to get so centered in them and get so bogged down that we become so stressed and burnt out. But we do have a God who not just cares for us, but he cares about the things that we go through. From the big things to the small things, whatever they may be. In Christ, we have rest and we have peace. And another thing to realize, it, this doesn't mean that our troubles won't suddenly vanish away. Because we all still face trials in this world that we live in. But it means that they don't have to control or overwhelm us. One thing I learned about sheep is that they're easily startled by loud and strange noises. Uh, they can apparently smell predators that they know uh, and sense danger. They also won't sleep if they know that danger is near or around them. And that's why the shepherd takes his sheep to green and peaceful pastures where it is safe for the sheep to rest. And Jesus provides the security. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. We can all bring our troubles, our issues, our <coughs> fears, our temptations, and all of our loss to Christ and rest in the peace of his security. So the good shepherd gives his sheep rest. He also gives his sheep refreshment. At the end of verse 2, it says, He leads me besides the still waters. I can't remember where I learned this one, but I learned somewhere that sheep won't drink from fast-flowing sources of water. So like fast-flowing rivers or torrents, they, they, I, I, I guess they're scared of them in case they fall in or whatever. And that is why the shepherd leads his sheep to calm and still waters. We all need refreshing, don't we? In a very physical sense, it's the food and drink that we consume during the day at meal times. It's even the tea breaks that we take at work, and it's even the drinks breaks that we take when we're playing sports. They're all important, otherwise we'll run out of energy and our bodies will or won't function properly. Notice what that part of the verse says. It says, he leads me besides the still waters. Not he pushes me besides still waters. Jesus doesn't force us or push us, but he does know what is best for us and what we need. His sheep are cared for from head to tail. He says, I'm the good shepherd, I know my own sheep, and my own sheep know me. Jesus knows us, he knows our needs, and he leads us to areas of extraordinary lushness and nourishment. In another of his 
I am statements. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. God's care for us is extensive and all-encompassing. I think it was sometime last month, me and my wife Rachel, we went to London uh, to meet up with some of her old friends from university. And I think we met up in is it Camden Town. Um, and I think the first thing on the agenda was not just after meeting everyone, was to, to find something to eat. Um, and it was surprisingly a lot of options in, in this area of London, like lots of market stalls and, and things like that. But I can't remember, it felt like hours we were walking around to find something we could all agree on uh, to eat. There was always something wrong with one of the options. Either our, our, our voucher wasn't accepted, uh, it was too busy in one place, it was too expensive in one place. One place was all vegetarian and we didn't want that. It felt like we were wandering around for ages and eventually we got on the tube and went all the way to Chinatown to eat. In that sense, we were like sheep without a shepherd, just wandering around looking for stuff to eat. But the good shepherd knows the greenest pastures and the stillest waters and he is able to lead them there. I think it's quite a, like a countercultural thing to say, uh, I'm, I don't know what is best for my life. So Lord, you take control of my life. You know best, Lord, not me. So Lord, you lead me. Mm. But in Christ, we truly lack nothing. Despite our current circumstances, whatever we may be going through. There is immense security and rest in Christ's encompassing care. In a sense, we can all relax in his sufficiency and be content in Christ. Food and drink obviously satisfy temporarily and in a physical way. Uh, but what does the Bible have to say? It says, man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord in Deuteronomy 8.3. So let us always be feasting, not just on physical food, but on the living word of God, mm. learning more and more about our good shepherd who loves us and growing in the faith that we have in him, growing closer to him in all things day by day. But the Good Shepherd gives us rest. He gives us refreshment. And into verse 3 of Psalm 23, He restores my soul. It's a restoration both eternal and very present as well. The, the salvation that we as believers have, it's no quick fix if you like it's not like putting a plaster on a small cut it's not like taking paracetamol for a headache but when Nicodemus comes to Jesus in John 3 Jesus says most assuredly I say to you unless one is born again he cannot see the kingdom of God our salvation isn't a little thing because we're saved from a very big thing. Mm. Apart from Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We approach God spiritually dead and bankrupt, and we can't heal the dead, can we? Not that I know. And there's nothing someone can do if they're dead. They can't do anything, so they can't undeaden themselves. But it is God who grants new life. God who grants new life through his own resurrection. Our God is in the restoration business. I don't know if anyone has seen, there's a show on TV called Salvage Hunters. But you have this, this guy, he goes around the, the, the UK finding old, uh, either antiques or broken down stuff or 
what they call the architectural salvage. So like could be pieces of a gate or whatever. And it's all battered and most people would think it's rubbish to be thrown away. But he has a team of people who take these things and literally give it a new lease of life. Not just put a coat of paint on it, but replace like table legs and upholstery, all that type of stuff. So it looks like new. And I think that's a little bit similar to what God does with us. We're rotten to the core because of our sin. We're completely dead and deserve to be thrown on the, in, in the dust, in the ash heap. But we've been born again and given new life in Christ. Amen. That's that eternal restoration that God gives. There's also regular restoration that he gives to us when we ask here on earth because of our continued sin and our continued stumbling. We don't suddenly stop sinning 100% when we become a Christian. We still are prone to wander, as one hymn says. Well, that's another amazing thing about God's grace. When we stumble, God doesn't reject us still. But he restores us to our position in the flock. He restores us to the protection of the fold. And he restores us to our place of fellowship with him. Just like he restored Peter after being rejected by him. And in, his, in Jesus' parable, the father restores the prodigal son back into the family. And onto our final real benefit of, uh, that the shepherd gives his sheep. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Again, if we take that parable of the, the prodigal son, we have the younger son uh, who rebels and squanders the wealth of the father and goes off and spends the wealth in reckless and sinful living. He then recognizes his sin, his error, goes back home and was forgiven and welcomed back, uh, back into the family with grace and favor. But we also have the older son too, uh, who stayed at home but was full of self-righteousness and pride, thinking that he had earned and deserved the father's favor because of all the stuff that he did. Mm. What did the father say to him? He said, all that I have is yours. This son didn't have to work for the father's favor. Mm. And we can be like both sons, can't we? Ultimately, unrighteous or self-righteous because of our sin and our disobedience. In Isaiah 64, 6, it says, All our righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of God. And that's why the Lord redirects us to a different path. And that path is Jesus, Amen. the one who is fully and completely righteous because of his sinlessness. On the cross, Christ's righteousness and his right standing with God was imputed to us. It was ascribed to us. Mm -hmm. Jesus took away our wretchedness and he clothed us with his righteousness. He gave us his righteousness. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin, our shame, our guilt. He sees the righteousness of Christ on us and in us. And we as Christians are continually being sanctified by God. We're being made more right, more righteous, less sinful, but more holy, more like Jesus day by day as we walk with him. So those are the things that God gives. Obviously, it's not an exhaustive list from those two verses, but there's one more part uh, in verse three that we'll finish with tonight. If I read verses 2 and 3 again, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. For His name's sake. Mm. Why does the Lord not just save us, but continue to care for us and continue to shepherd us? 
Yes, he's a loving and faithful God, but he continues with us primarily because of his honor and his good name. The, the maintenance and upkeep of our faith is not dependent on our actions, on our good deeds, on our being a good Christian. It is, however, guaranteed by the promise, the word, and the oath of God. God binds his own reputation on seeing us through to our final heavenly destination. Amen. He promises we will stay on the train of the Christian journey until we pull up into the last stop of glory and majesty. Philippians 1 verse 6 Paul says we can be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. To me, that's a great reassurance, especially when I feel that my faith is like weaker on one day than it is on another. When it may feel like that faith will fail if the devil comes along and throws some temptation or sin in the way. But we can rest assured, brothers and sisters, that the Good Shepherd will not allow our faith to fail. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. He gives us rest. He gives us refreshment. He gives us restoration, redirection, and a blessed reassurance Mm. that he will not lose one of his sheep. What a Good Shepherd we have. And what a good God we have. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our good shepherd. Thank you, Lord, that though we go astray like that, uh, one missing sheep, Lord, you don't leave us, but you come and find us. Uh, And when when you find us, you lift us on on your shoulders and take us back to the flock. And you celebrate all the way rejoicing that you have found us. Thank you, Lord, that we are in your flock and you are our shepherd. The shepherd who has laid down his life for us. Lord, we know that we are unworthy of your grace, your favor, your mercy. But Lord, you pilot upon us more and more day by day. Your mercy and faithfulness are new every morning. So we can thank you for that. Continue, Lord, to keep us walking on your path, talking with you and keeping our eyes fixed upon you, Lord Jesus, day by day. Mm. And we thank you, Lord, that we can boldly approach your throne of grace with confidence, seeking mercy and grace to help in times of need. Lord, continue to strengthen us and continue to grant us your wisdom. And we thank you for your unending faithfulness to us despite Mm. our unfaithfulness to you Mm. keep us in you lord keep leading us to those still waters and green pastures and help us to accomplish your will here on earth whatever that may be and however that looks like in each of our lives may we remain firm and steadfast in you lord continue to be with this church and this congregation, Lord, those present and those elsewhere, uh, continue to uphold them in your righteous right hand, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We will be closing with a final hymn, which I think is 746. Uh, what a friend we have in Jesus. So. Let's stand when the music starts and sing 746, what a friend we have in Jesus. Peace we are.
who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 